On the 1st of March, in 1940, Sumner Wells arrived in Germany from America and spent three days in Berlin talking to the Nazis to find out if Britain and Germany could get along well enough to continue making payments on their debt to America. The American president of General Motors was in Berlin at the time, wanting to do business with Germany and getting along well with them. And as Sumner Wells arrived in Berlin, the British announced they were cutting off shipments of German coal to Italy through Rotterdam, hoping to force the Italians to buy coal from England. And Hitler told Italy that he was unimpressed because he could make all the coal deliveries to Italy by railroad. Hitler received me near the door. He greeted me pleasantly. Hitler was taller than I judged from his photographs. He had in real life none of the ludicrous features so often shown in his photographs. He seemed in excellent physical condition and in good training. His color was good, and while his eyes were tired, they were clear. He was dignified, both in speech and movement. His voice in conversation was low and well modulated. It had only once during our conversation of an hour and a half the raucous stridency which is often heard in his speeches, and it was only at that moment that his features lost their composure. He spoke with clarity and precision, and I was able to follow every word in German. He said that, for example, while Germany would doubtless profit by taking a considerable portion of America's industrial surpluses, an industrial country like Germany could not take any large part of America's industrial production, nor could the United States import Germany's manufactured, manufactured products on a big scale. It was consequently necessary for Germany to intensify her trade relations with countries in Central and Southeastern Europe, which desired Germany's industrial exports, which they themselves did not produce, in return for raw materials needed by Germany. The Time for Decision, page 102 and 3 and 106. When I returned to Paris four days later, March 4, 1940, my secretaries estimated that while I was in England, almost 3,000 letters had been received addressed to me by Frenchmen, and in no stereotyped form protesting against my visit. The vast majority of these letters were written in the most violent and insulting terms. A few of them were couched in moderate words of reproach. They were all written, however, solely because, as a representative of the President of the United States, I had dared to call upon a Jew. I have lived in France, and I have known France since the time of my earliest childhood, and all of those years, except during the period of the Dreyfus case, I had never found that anti-Semitism existed in France. Now, for the first time, I realized how widely the poison engendered by the Nazis had already seeped into Western Europe. It was on the morning of March 11, 1940, that I left Le Bourget for London on a plane offered me by the French government. The Time for Decision, page 129. After hearing from Sumner Wells, Hitler gave the order to begin Operation Viserubung, and it was not to go into action until the 2nd of April, and then commence on the 9th of April in 1940. Once more the anti-Nazi plotters tried to persuade the general to depose the leader, this time before he could launch his new aggression in the north, of which they had got wind. What the civilian conspirators again wanted was assurance from the British government that it would make peace with an anti-Nazi German regime. It was with such a proposal that Hassel, with considerable personal courage, journeyed to Arosa, Switzerland, on February 21, 1940, to confer with British a British contact whom he calls Mr. X in his diary, and who was a certain J. Lonsdale Bryans, who had contacts in Downing Street, and Hassel, once they had met, was personally impressed by him. After the fiasco of the attempt of Major Stevens and Captain Best in Holland to get in touch with the German conspirators, the British were somewhat skeptical of the whole business. Hassel then outlined the views of the German quote-unquote opposition. It was realized that Hitler had to be overthrown quote, before major military operations were undertaken, close quote, that this must be quote, an entirely and exclusively German affair, close quote. 
that there must be, quote, some authoritative English statement, close quote, about how the new anti-Nazi regime in Berlin would be treated and that, quote, the principal obstacle to any change in regime is the story of 1918 that is Germany, German anxiety lest things develop as they did then after the Kaiser was sacrificed, close quote. So ended the latest attempt of the, quote, unquote, good Germans to oust Hitler, before it was too late, the rise and fall of the Third Reich, page 692 to 4. Admiral Canaris was an obvious Anglophile and a traitor to the fatherland, and Canaris had tried to talk the Scandinavians out of joining the Reich, but the Scandinavians had made the British unwelcome and greeted the Germans with respect, and one of the battleship Graf Spee's supply boats, the Altmark, quote, managed to slip through the British blockade and on February 14 was discovered by a British scouting plane proceeding southward in Norwegian territorial waters towards Germany, close quote, the rise and fall of the Third Reich, page 679. And January 27, 1940, he, Canaris, had Keitel issue a top-secret directive stating that further work on North be continued until the Fuhrer's, quote, personal immediate supervision under the Fuhrer's personal immediate supervision and directing Keitel to take care of all preparations, a small working staff composed of one representative from each of the three armed services was to be set up at OKW and then, henceforth the operation was to have the code name Viserubong, Ibid. The Norwegians had given permission for the Altmark to sail, and on the 17th of February, quote, Churchill personally ordered a British destroyer to go into Norwegian waters and free some British POWs on board the Altmark. In so doing, four Germans were killed and five wounded, close quote. The rise and fall of the Third Reich, page 680. The Norwegian government made a vehement protest to Britain about this violation of its territorial waters, but Chamberlain replied in the Commons that Norway itself had violated international law by allowing its waters to be used by the Germans to convey British prisoners to a German prison. For Hitler, this was the last straw, Ibid. In April of 1940, the British told the Scandinavians to stop doing Britain business with Germany, but the Scandinavians said that was bad for business and told Britain that England could buy Scandinavian iron ore instead of it being sold to Germany, but Britain couldn't afford to pay for Norwegian iron ore, although the British could threaten the shipping lanes, so Scandinavia asked Germany for help. The British announced a blockade of sea lanes to Germany and Germany announced a counter-blockage, and with British warships obstructing trade with Germany, Hitler responded with U-boats, and as the British prepared to invade Finland, the Russians beat them to it. On March 7, 1940, General Ironside, chief of the British general staff, informed Marshal Mannerheim that an Allied expeditionary force of 57,000 men was ready to come to the aid of the Finns and that the 1st Division of 15,000 troops could reach Finland by the end of March if Norway and Sweden would allow them transit. Actually, five days before on March 2, as Mannerheim knew, both Norway and Sweden had again turned down the Franco-British request for transit privileges. This did not prevent Premier Daladier on March 8 from scolding the Finns for not officially asking for Allied troops and from intimating that the Allied force forces would be sent regardless of Norwegian and Swedish protests rise and fall, 682 following. On the 12th of March in 1940, Finland and, Finland and Russia agreed to a peace to keep out the British who were preparing to land in Finland, and the Germans landed in Denmark and Norway while the British landed at three different locations but were kicked off the Scandinavian homeland by early May. And that had been easy because the British Navy and British Army got into a fight with one another and the British Air Force failed to cooperate with either of the others. 
The British plan to invade Norway had brought the Germans into Scandinavia first, and Russia was very glad that the German navy was able to stop the British from disrupting trade in the Baltics. During this year of the phony war, the French invaded Germany's Saar and planned to open a French-British front in the Balkans from where they could launch a campaign to cut off Russia's supply of oil to Germany. And the phony war dragged on and on and on, and Denmark and Norway joined the Reich in April of 1940, and Norway was conquered by 1,500 Germans and three brass bands. Anyway... We met for dinner at Stalin's that Sunday in August 1939. And while the trophies of our hunt were being prepared for the table, Stalin told us that Ribbentrop had brought with him a draft of friendship and non-aggression and a non-aggression treaty, which we had signed. Stalin seemed very pleased with himself. He said that when the English and French, who were still in Moscow, found out about the treaty the next day, they would immediately leave for home. The English and French representatives who came to Moscow to talk with Voroshilov didn't really want to join forces with us against Germany at all. Our discussions with them were fruitless. We knew that they weren't serious about an alliance with us and that their real goal was to incite Hitler against us. We were just as glad to see them leave. Khrushchev remembers, page 128. On November 13, 1940, the Russians went to Berlin to discuss the war, but had to retire to a bomb shelter when a British plane dropped some bombs on the meeting. The Germans assured their guests that Britain was working with them, but Molotov replied, Then why are we in this shelter, and whose are these bombs that are falling on us? Khrushchev remembers, page 132. Hitler and Stalin had divided Poland equally between them to keep the British away from their borders, and the month after their meeting in Berlin, in November of 1940, Hitler ordered preparations for Arbor Operation Barbarossa because the British told him that Stalin was planning to take all of Poland instead of just their half, and the French were more willing to have Germans in France than British, and it was at this point Standing alone, with her army greatly weakened, Britain prepared to meet a German invasion. The Outline of History by H. G. Wells, New York, Doubleday and Company, Inc., 1920, 1949, 1962, page 159. Hitler had to strike Russia first if there were any hope of beating them, because the Americans had gotten wind of the British plan to destroy Russia and were supplying Stalin with trucks and war material. And Germany did not attack Britain because Hitler believed that when England saw the entire world going along with the Reich, the British Empire would respect the German sphere of influence and would stay busy with their own empire. However, the British began harassing aerial bombing raids into Germany and after 20 months of war with Germany, Britain would secure a loan from America to prop them up in order that the British could pay back the loans still outstanding to America from the Great War. FDR had wanted Britain to be able to pay its debts to America, and FDR had closed all American banks as a national emergency on the 9th of March in 1933 because British banks were holding as collateral all the mortgages bought up cheap in America after the Great Crash of 1929, and they would also acquire German mortgage bonds bought up cheap in 1934, and Germany would start defaulting on mortgage payments in 1937. FDR's plan to close all American banks had passed through Congress in special session that 9th of March in 1933 and it gave FDR control of all currency exchange and gave the Secretary of the Treasury the power to call in all gold because of the national emergency, and seven years later, Hitler would march into France. In 1925, Britain had owed America five billion dollars from the Great War and had paid one and a half billion by 1940, and when the British needed help to fight Hitler, the U.S. was barred by the Neutrality and Johnson Acts, and Britain didn't think it was fair to let Italy be allowed to have their debt reduced by half. Britain could sell their colonial territories in the Caribbean, 
some islands off the Newfoundland coast, their British Guiana and Honduras, and the Falkland Islands to pay off the debt owed to America, but Britain refused. So Arm and Hammer suggested that they lease these places to the U.S. for military bases at $25 million for each of the 13 colonial territories for 99 years, and that would clear the British debt and allow the U.S. to loan more money to the Crown. Senator King of Utah brought this proposal to the floor of Congress on the 30th of September in 1940, and it went to committee for discussion. And on Thanksgiving Day in 1940, Armand went to ask FDR how the bill was progressing, and while waiting in FDR's office, Armand made $300 playing craps with an American major general. FDR told Armand that England had other untapped resources that they were refusing to offer for payment, and Armand told FDR that Hitler wouldn't wait, but FDR looked squarely at Armand and refused to back down. He, FDR, smiled wryly, and after a moment's thought, he replied, Everything in Germany can be bombed. Everything in England can be bombed. But England has something that can't be bombed. The United States. Hammer, page 267. On the 9th of February, in 1942, the Normandy was set on fire while it was being converted to a troop transport in New York Harbor and the fire broke out when the pumps and fire protection system were disconnected, and the U.S. had seized the Normandy the week after Pearl Harbor, and since then America hadn't placed any orders for new ships built in England. The Normandy had been built in France in 1932, and was a beautiful cruise ship, a French luxury liner that could accommodate 2,000 passengers, and she was the fastest ship of her kind on the sea. And U-boats had been reported to have been seen within sight of the Statue of Liberty. The next time I saw the handsome, amiable, amiable, slippery Count was the following night at a movie that Ambassador and Mrs. Phillips showed to a number of guests after dinner at the embassy. It was drums along the Mohawk. The Phillipses, like the Kennedys in London, circumnavigated diplomatic after-dinner conversational difficulties by showing American films. <clears throat> drums along the Mohawk was enormously popular with their Italian guests. It was perfectly obvious why. Here were the young pioneers, the nation-builders, carving prosperity out of an untamed land, struggling heroically for their economic and political freedom, and constantly being obliged to slaughter the poor natives who had been sicked on them by the wicked British. The Ethiopian parallel was pleasantly clear. Europe in the Spring, page 59 and 60. The British legend of King Arthur was that might does not make right and that meant that intelligence was supposed to prevail over armed force, that the winner would be determined by brains and not brawn, that victory could be due to something other than mere physical power, and the British thought they were the smartest cookies around. However, it was important to know that cleverness must not be mistaken for intelligence, and in war a bullet was more determinative than ten times its weight in brains. The town of Austerlitz in the province of Utrecht in Holland was given its name in honor of Napoleon defeating the Russian and Austrian allies of Alexander I and Francis II at the Battle of Austerlitz in Austria during the British-led war effort that ended the Third Coalition with the Treaty of Pressburg. And Bratislava was the Western word for Pressburg. Prussia had been offered the territory of Hanover to stay out of the Third Coalition, while Napoleon would offer Hanover to Britain as a peace offering, and France and Austria had immediately agreed to the Treaty of Pressburg on the 27th of December in 1805, after Napoleon defeated them in Austria at Austerlitz, and with the Treaty of Pressburg, Napoleon won Luneburg and Austria lost Trieste, and within months the Austrian Emperor was forced to give up his title of Holy Roman Emperor, lest it be given to the triumphant Napoleon. Francis, too, blamed the British for the deal they'd made with Prussia over Hanover.
and after the defeat of Napoleon, the title of Holy Roman Emperor had been taken from, from Francis II and shelved. But there was nothing to stop Hitler from bringing it back, since the Reich now comprised all the lands that had made up the Holy Roman Empire, and one thing about those Nazis was they sure could sing. In August of 1920, all the Germanic head patriots in Austria, Czechoslovakia, and the Greater Reich were meeting in Salzburg, and Hitler gave two speeches on the 7th and 8th of August, and he won them over, and they all vowed loyalty to the fatherland, and among these dedicated men was the war hero, Lieutenant Commander von Trapp. Sub-Lieutenant Dernitz had just been released from custody in Britain the month before, having been incarcerated since the armistice. And Hitler's first speech on the 7th of August in 1920 was called Volksgemeinschaft, or In Opposition to Class Thinking. The speech went on for hours, and they invited him back the following evening, and Hitler spoke for another hour and a half, and he was asked to speak again two months later on the 1st of October for a couple hours, and then he went again in 1923 to their August convention in Salzburg, and it had been to these leaders meeting in Salzburg in August of 1920 that Hitler had described the Weimar Socialists as a failure and a disgrace, and it was there that he had added the word national to socialism in order to make his vision unmistakably clear to them. Von Trapp was a resident of Salzburg, and that was where the abbey had been built during the days of Charlemagne, up in the hills on the north side of the Alps, erected onto solid rock with the base of the walls nine feet thick and rising three hundred feet straight up out of the valley. And when German troops marched into Salzburg on the 12th of March in 1938, the Hitler Youth lit solstice fires shaped like swastikas on the sides of the mountains surrounding Salzburg, those mountains where Julie Andrews would sing about the hills being alive. Two days later, on the 14th of March, Hitler marched into Vienna, the capital city of the Holy Roman Empire, and the church bells rang out and the crowds shouted for him well into the night, with no likelihood of going silent any time soon. So Hitler stepped out onto the balcony of his hotel and said, what you are feeling now is something I myself have felt to the bottom of my heart in these five days. It is a great historic change which our German Volk have undergone. What you are witnessing at this moment is something the whole German Folk is experiencing with you. Not only two million people in this city, but 75 million members of our Volk in one Reich. They are all deeply stirred and moved by this historic turning point, and they all consecrate themselves with the vow. No matter what may happen, the German Reich as it stands today is something no man will ever break asunder, and no man will ever again tear apart. There is no crisis, no threat, and no force that might break this vow. Today, these are the devout words of all German beings from Königsberg to Cologne, from Hamburg to Vienna. Pockets of communists opposed this Anschluss into Austria, especially in Bischofshofen, but they were quickly cleaned up in the next few days, and 72,000 Jew communists were arrested and sent to work in the camps. And in the Klesheim Palace outside Salzburg, Hitler was recorded as saying, if the Jews do not want to work there, then they will be shot. If they cannot work, they will go to seed. They must be treated like the tuberculosis bacillus that can infect a healthy body. This is not cruel if you consider that even innocent creatures of nature, like the rabbit and the deer, are shot so that they cannot do harm. Why should you be more kind to these beasts who want to bring us Bolshevism? Nations that do not fight off the Jews go to seed. The decline of the once so proud Persian people is one of the most famous examples of this. Today they lead as pitiful an existence as the Armenians. It had been in Salzburg on the 1st of May in 1938 
that the good residents burnt up the twelve hundred Jew communist books they had collected to feed into a bonfire that made the newsreels, and von Trapp from Salzburg had joined the Austrian navy just as his father had before him, and during the Great War Austria had an outstanding navy operating out of the lovely port of Trieste. Von Trapp was given command of a submarine, one of the first experimental versions that were usually filled with engine exhaust, and the periscope could not be raised or lowered, but the whole boat had to be moved with the periscope. Von Trapp sank British convoys in the Adriatic Sea, and he destroyed enemy ships in German waters, and von Trapp became a hero in the Great War, and had the war continued, he would have been promoted much further than lieutenant commander, the equivalent of an army major. Von Trapp won the cross of the Empress Maria Theresa for personal bravery in combat, the very highest medal there was, even though he'd acted against orders, since that was the nature of the award, that if the action succeeded they would receive the Maria Theresa cross, but if it failed they would be courts martialed His whole nation was proud of him. He was not only popular but really beloved. But then it all turned out so differently. Austria was defeated and stripped of her entire seacoast. The proud imperial navy was no more. In the prime of life, near the peak of his fame, the captain was brushed aside in the whirlwind. The story of the Trapp family singers by Maria Augusta Trapp, Philadelphia J.B. Lippincott Company, 1949, page 27. In losing the Great War, Austria also lost access to the sea, so von Trapp was out of a job. The Depression overwhelmed Austria in 1932, and the bank failed where von Trapp kept his money. And with ten hungry children, the captain took his children onto the stage, even though he thought that appearing in public was bad manners because he was an aristocrat. But his second wife insisted. All the officers in the German army were aristocrats, but von Trapp had no other income, so they sang on stage for Hitler in 1936, and then they moved to Vermont and opened a ski lodge. There had been a CCC camp in Vermont that the government was planning to tear down, so the von Trapps asked Uncle Sam if they could use it as a camp of their own. When I was a young girl, I attended several times, so-called Sing Weeks. We met somewhere out in the country, groups of between fifty and a hundred, and we spent eight or ten days devoted only to music-making and folk dancing. I haven't seen that done in America yet. Couldn't we start them in that camp? The Story of the Trapp Family Singers, page 254. The von Trapps had eight barracks at the top of a hill with three more at the bottom used for a kitchen and some dining rooms. And the von Trapps installed plumbing and put in the latest in kitchen machinery and they hired a Chinese cook and they turned the guardhouse into a chapel. While Hitler's war raged in Europe, the von Trapps welcomed their first 100 guests to their singing camp, and all the locals showed up for the grand opening, with the governor of Vermont giving a speech as the American flag was raised. At home in Austria, a farm was a self-sustaining independent unit. You tried to grow a little bit of everything for the people and for the animals, and a little more than enough to sell to buy the few items you couldn't grow, such as coffee, tobacco, and cotton material. The wool of your own sheep was spun at home and woven or knitted. The pigs supplied you with smoked meat for the whole year, and lard besides. For sweetness you had your honey. The flax of the field provided all the linen. Eventually you slaughtered some beef cattle or a sheep or some geese, ducks, chickens to get variety in your menu. In the orchard behind the house you had cherry, apple, and pear trees, and in a protected corner even some peaches and grapevines. In the vegetable garden was a berry corner for strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, and currants. From your own rye you baked that delicious black bread and you always kept enough grain for next year's seed. That way, each farmer on his homestead was an independent little king in his own realm. The Story of the Trap Family Singers, page 215 and 16. Two of the von Trapp boys fought for the U.S. in Europe and would visit their old hometown in Austria. 
to find out that Himmler had used their house as his headquarters, and that he had slept in their parents' bedroom, and that the Nazis had used their chapel as a beer parlor, and the von Trapps were given their old house back after the war, but they didn't want it any more, so they sold it to a religious group from America. Major von Trapp would die of lung cancer on the 30th of May in 1947, and he was buried using his old U-boat flag as a blanket, and Maria wrote a 14-page letter for the funeral that said in the last paragraph, It seems to have been cancer after all. A few weeks after his death I heard of a doctor who, in his own practice, had had 17 cases of cancer of the lungs of which every single patient was a U-boat man from the First World War. Thus it would not be impossible that the trap died a hero's death, true till the last flag was furled. The Story of the Trap Family Singers, page 299. Von Trapp had been fascinated with submarines, and in 1908 had been transferred to the Navy's new f newly formed submarine division, where he was given command of the Austrian U-6 in 1910, and would remain its captain until 1913, when he was given the Austrian U-5 that would be his boat during the Great War and the four submarines of that class launched in 1909 had been going on ten training cruises every month until they went into action in 1914. A U-boat was an undersea boat, and the first U-boats built in 1906 were prototypes until they started getting good in 1910, when seven U-boats were built, and these were designed to operate at a depth of 160 feet, but could dive to 300 feet in a pinch. The design improved further in 1911, and another six U-boats were put to sea after a six-month pause for retooling, and only two experimental boats were launched in January and March of 1911, and that brought on the improved version at the end of the summer in 1911 with four U-boats that could now do some real damage. The following spring, the U-17 and U-18 came out in April of 1912 and would remain the only one of their kind, and submarine building would resume in 1913 with the launching of 12 new U-boats, one every month, and that would continue into the year 1914 until the beginning of the Great War, when submarine production greatly increased. When the war started, the German Navy had 48 submarines of various kinds, either working or under construction, and that would increase to 375 undersea boats by the end of the Great War. Some of the submarines were built at Krupp's Germania shipyard at Kiel, Kiel where 84 of the U-boats were produced during the Great War, and Kiel was 60 miles away from the North Sea through the Kiel Canal that cut through the base of the Danish peninsula. The Lusitania was sunk by the U-20 in May of 1915, just south of Ireland, on the same route that the Titanic had sailed out of Southampton and the British had been blockading Germany when the Lusitania was sunk, but the U-boats could still get through, and the gun mounts on the Lusitania had been installed, but she'd not gotten, she'd not yet gotten her guns. Blockading Germany meant that all food imports were being seized by the British as contraband, and they had mined the Danish Straits as well as the approaches to the Kaiser Kiel Canal and the Lusitania sank in 20 minutes after a second internal explosion fired off, killing 1,200 people. An inventory of the munitions on board has yet to be completed due to the danger of the task, and the Germans claimed that the identity of the Lusitania had been disguised and that she had been flying no flags, and the sinking was supposed to bring America into the war because there were 130 Americans among those who died. While von Trapp had been learning about submarines in the lovely port of Trieste, construction on the Titanic began in April of 1909, and the hull plates of the Titanic were rolled steel that varied from one to one and a half inches thick and were held together with over three million iron and steel rivets. 
The Titanic was launched on the 31st of May in 1911, but she had not been chris christened with a bottle of champagne or any other alcohol in accordance with White Star Line policy, and an entire year after that went into fitting her out for her maiden jo journey on the 10th of April in 1912, and the Titanic bragged an underwater draft of 35 feet, and her hull plates were subject to becoming brittle in the cold. The early U-boats had a range of 4,000 miles, and that meant 2,000 miles was their point of no return. And the Titanic was sunk 2,000 miles away from the coast of Ireland, from where any U-boat could have refueled with the help of the friendly Irish after it had sailed from the Germans' base at Heligoland. And the Germans knew that they could not un outrun the Titanic because the submarine could only manage 12 miles per hour submerged and 16 on the surface, while the Titanic was boasting 28 miles per hour full out. The Germans knew that the Titanic had wireless, so if they were to make any kind of maritime statement, it would have to be done at night under cover of darkness, and if a U-boat rammed the side of the Titanic, it could feel like an iceberg until clandestine agents delivered the news to the Royal Navy that it had indeed been a submarine. Tests had shown that the U-boat would not be harmed in so doing, as hitting their dock back home was a frequent occurrence, and that was what had given them the idea in the first place. The British would report that it must have been an iceberg, because the English-speaking world would be terrified to learn that Germany had U-boats that could travel that far, a mere 700 miles off the shores of North America and the Germans had only wanted to leave a scrape on the side of the Titanic to prove that a U-boat had been there, but the cold steel on cold steel did much more damage than had been anticipated. Had the purpose be been to sink her, the U-boat could have easily torpedoed the ship, and it would be reported by survivors that the Titanic's captain had seen a single white light from a distance that had probably been the U-boat surfacing to see if the Titanic had noticed their presence. The Titanic weighed 52,000 tons, and the U-boat weighed only 500 tons, and when the U-boat surfaced from a safe distance, they had seen the Titanic stopped in the water, firing white rockets, and when the Titanic's captain watched the light moving away, he had instructed the men lowering the white lifeboats to row towards that light. The Germans, who had surfaced half an hour after ramming into the ship, thought the white rockets were a celebratory gesture meant to reassure any passengers who might have heard the noise of contact, which should have been incredibly loud inside the U-boat and the Germans had seen that the rockets being fired from the Titanic were ro white instead of red, and red rockets at sea would have met, meant distress or an emergency, and so they had turned towards home because they were burning precious gasoline. The SMU-17 was launched the day after the sinking of the Titanic, and this new submarine had an improved range of 7,700 miles. And with the U-17, Germany took a great leap forward from the previous 16 U-boats. Its brother, the U-18, was launched on the 25th of April in 1912, and the next German submarines would have a range of 12,000 miles, beginning with the SMU-19, launched in October. And after the U-17 and 18, no U-boat would be completed for the next six months. After the three submarines of the U-13 class that were operating in 1912 had demonstrated the ability to sail that far into the ocean, they had not so much proved the capability of the machine as they had shown the stamina of the men, and all of the U-boats after the sinking of the Titanic would be built with extended range capabilities previously thought to be beyond human endurance. The British had planned to put some really big guns on board the Titanic, because they knew the Great War was coming, so room had been left on Titanic's decks for shore battery guns instead of putting in lifeboats, and while the Titanic's future as a warship was not openly discussed, the British military had paid for much of its construction and had even designed Titanic's engines. Somewhere in the deep, cold, 
dark North Sea, the submariners had been laying in wait for the ti Titanic. And after making contact with its hull, when they surfaced to see the huge ship stop dead in the water, they could verify that the, that the Titanic had noticed their signature and that the mission had been accomplished. The terrific scraping noise of their boat rubbing along the side of the ship would be enough to prove their point without any loss of life, and they had been able to determine the exact path of the ship in those days before zigzagging would become the rule. Their calculations made by the stars told them precisely where the ship would be coming along, and the mark on the ship would prove their claim, rather than the British thinking that perhaps the Titanic had merely hit some flotsam or maybe even a dead whale. The Germans had been lying in wait for her, and would have been able to see her lights from a long way off and the U-boat had only one chance to leave that mark on the Titanic because the ocean liner was running twice as fast as the submarine could possibly manage, and so it had indeed been an impressive feat that should have given Britain pause in their warmongering against the fatherland. Rather than simply bumping the ship a single time, the U-boat was prepared to thrust her engines fully forward at the first sign of contact, rather than merely bouncing off once. And after blowing their ballast and submerging beneath the wake of the Titanic, the U-boat had continued beneath the surface until they were out of range of Titanic searchlights, even though the British would say that there had been no searchlights on board, which would explain why they couldn't search for the iceberg on which to unload the passengers. There had been some confusion aboard the Titanic about whether they had hit an iceberg or a U-boat, because some on deck claimed to have seen a submarine right before they hit. But these witnesses had been drinking a great deal and had been reading too many newspapers. However, the captain probably thought it was a U-boat because he had immediately ordered full speed ahead to get away from the submarine. And when damage reports came back that the increased speed was flooding the ship's watertight compartments, the captain had ordered the engines to a neutral stop, at which point an iceberg was nowhere to be seen, onto which they could have offloaded the passengers once it was determined that the ship was doomed. Newspapers would report that ice had spilled onto the deck from being scraped off an iceberg because they didn't want to alarm the public about any German U-boats that could make a long, narrow, sharp gash in ships well below the waterline. And Captain Lord on board the California thought the Titanic was just shooting off fireworks in celebration because somebody had loaded the wrong color rockets on the Titanic that were supposed to be red instead of white. Some said that the, that the Titanic's captain had ordered a turn to port to get closer to the single bright light he had seen on the horizon that the radio men purported to have been the California, and they said that the captain had tried to get closer to it when he ordered the turn to port, but the light had been moving away from them. The captain wanted to signal to it with lights instead of relying on the Marconi so he had started up Titanic's engines again to generate enough electricity to power the larger lights, since without her engines running, there were only two 30-kilowatt generators for emergency use, and he had stayed stationary because moving through the sea had been causing the ship to take on, take on water faster. Of the 2,224 people on board, give or take, 710 would be saved, and 212 of them were crewmen needed to row the lifeboats that were carrying 500 passengers away from the sinking ship, lest they be sucked into the vortex when it went under. The next morning, the people in the lifeboats were rescued by the Carpathia, a ship named after a mountain range outside Vienna that was as far from the bottom of the ocean as possible on planet Earth. Numerous eyewitness accounts described the ship splitting in two before it sank, and the day would come when a camera could be sent down to take photographs of the wreckage of the Titanic that was over 12,000 feet deep with water pressure over 6,000 pounds per square inch. 
the French sent down ultrasound radar to look beneath the mud into which the ship had settled on the seafloor, and they documented that there had been no sharp gash such as the men seeing the damage firsthand had described. But instead the ship had a series of four long thin openings, smaller than the size of a human hand, a buckling along the line of the hull plates where they had been forced open and the seawater was able to come through. Less than half a dozen men working in the boiler rooms had seen the actual damage before the fatal crack was completely submerged under water and the French radar showed the buckling had started at the front of the ship, 24 feet above the keel or 11 feet below the water line, and the cracking increased in length as it skipped four times along the front third of the ship, the first crack 12 feet long, the second 16 feet, the third 33 feet, and the final gap 45 feet in length, extending another two feet aft of boiler room number six, where the men had been working to stoke the fires that ran Titanic's engines. Each scar was divided by an increasing interval from 24 feet to 30 feet to 39 feet between them, and they dropped down in a decreasing sequence from 24 feet above the keel near the bow to ten feet above the keel at boiler room number six, as though the iceberg had been given the order to dive. One of Titanic's crew named George Simons testified that he had thought the Titanic had lost her anchor with its chain because it sounded as though the chain were dragging along underneath the ship and the scraping had gone on for ten long seconds, and Simons was an able seaman who had already made the Atlantic crossing over five dozen times. Simons also testified that after getting into the lifeboats, he had seen the same single white light that was five to ten miles away, and he and the others had taken it for a fishing vessel, and they had laid into the oars, rowing towards the light, but Simon said it had been moving away from them and then just disappeared. The witnesses who gave testimony during the subsequent investigation into the disaster were also split down the middle over over whether Titanic's engines had been ordered to stop before or after hitting the iceberg. <coughs> and the testimony also varied between those who had seen an iceberg and those who had not. And they differed between those who had seen block ice scraped onto the desk, deck and those who had seen none. <coughs> and when encouraged to give details about the iceberg, all the testimony appeared coordinated and rehearsed, except for one man who said that it had looked like the Rock of Gibraltar, and another two who said it was as big as two of the Senate room hearing tables put together. The British and the Americans conducted separate inquiries, and the British hearings lasted for 36 days, and the Americans took half that long, having gotten to the witnesses first while the survivors were in New York and their memories were fresh. The bulk of the questioning in Britain concerned why some partially full lifeboats had not gone back to save the people who were screaming in the 28 degree water, and the British also wanted to know whether or not the lifeboat rowers had taken bribes from the rich people they had rescued. In the end, it was determined that the wealthy passengers had merely donated charity to the sailors who had lost their jobs and possessions and possessions when the Titanic went down, and the British conclusion to the matter was that the Titanic had hit an iceberg that had split the ship open for 300 feet from the front of the bow all the way to boiler room number 6, even though some testimony described that there had been places towards the bow where the side of the ship had remained intact and water had not been coming in. No testimony was taken about any damage forward of boiler room number six, because within a half hour there had been eight feet of water in that section, and the ship was already listing as the front holds were being filled. 
Several firemen testified that they saw water pouring in from a crack on the starboard side, two feet above the floor in boiler room number six, and from these eyewitnesses working in that section, the British Commission determined that the plates had been gashed open by the iceberg ten feet above the bottom of the ship and twenty-five feet below the water line, which would have been at periscope depth. While the first hit at the bow was only 11 feet below the waterline, as determined by the French radar, and the consensus among every witness was that the sea had been as smooth as glass that night. The saddest part of the Titanic investigations was the testimony of the two young men who'd been in the crow's nest serving as lookouts that night and both of them were incapable of describing the iceberg no matter how hard they were pressed and their responses were painfully dedicated to an offering up of a suitable description of the iceberg that would satisfy the authorities hitler would depend heavily on u-boats in his war against the designers of the versailles treaty and sixty per cent of his submarines would be lost in action killing three-quarters of germany's forty thousand submariners and nobody could have imagined that Hitler's war would have gone on as long as it did. The German plan in the spring of 1940 had been to seize Fort Eben Emil in Belgium, and there the Germans would wait for a peace delegation from Britain to come divvy up France. And Eben Emil was on the Meuse, 12 miles north of Liège and 28 miles west of Aachen. When the treaty was signed, Normandy would belong to the British, where the King of England could finally become the King of France, and Western France would go to the Germans, while Hanover stayed with the British. And Germany would include Belgium and Holland in the Greater Reich as friendly satellite states. The British might let France keep the south of France just as long as they recognized the British as the rulers of the Mediterranean. And towards that end in 1940, German paratroopers landed on Fort Eben Emil in Belgium, overlooking the Albert Canal where they were to wait for the British, British to come sailing up to meet them just as soon as the German 18th Army arrived. The Albert Canal had been named after the Albert, who had held up the opium coming through the port of Antwerp in 1910 to raise the price of opium for the British. Belgium was a small country, 175 miles wide and 100 miles long, with dikes in Flanders to keep out the sea. And Belgium was on the same latitude as England, just across the English Channel. And Belgium had once been governed by the Austrian Habsburgs, but had won its independence after the year of revolutions in 1848. Half of the Belgians spoke Dutch, while the other half spoke French, and before the Great War the official language had been French, and most Belgians were Roman Catholics because the southern part of Belgium had been under Catholic Spanish rule until 1713. Belgium's main exports to England and France were the sugar beets, were sugar beets and hops. And Belgium had been famous for their alcoholic liqueur named Geneva, and when the British army landed on the continent in the spring of 1940 to march to the Franco-Belgium border, they came with 13 divisions totaling 130,000 soldiers, and they brought 21,000 vehicles and all the equipment they would need to maintain these troops that were in place by the end of September. The British knew from the Great War that asking the locals to meet their needs would force them into the trenches instead, and it had been on the 22nd of June in 1340 that the Hundred Years' War, oh, that the English had forced themselves onto the beaches in France during the first three years of the Hundred Years' War, and they'd landed on the coast of Flanders at Dunkirk and at Calais and had been able to disembark troops in France thereafter for the next thirty years. The British plan in 1940 required that the Maginot Line in France be abandoned, so Churchill ordered the French to march out from behind their defenses towards Belgium, but they didn't want to go because the French soldiers on the Maginot Line were enjoying their daily ration of one liter of wine every day, and there was more than mere suspicion 
that the whole thing was just another crooked British trap. The fort at Eben Email was the heart of Belgium's defense, but it required British and French forces to come to their rescue, since it was only a fort 200 yards by 400 yards surrounded by walls, and its roof was made of reinforced concrete five feet thick and it had six 120 millimeter artillery guns, 16 75 millimeter guns, 25 machine guns, 12 anti-tank guns, and some anti-aircraft guns. And the walls around the fort were 20 feet high and were protected by minefields and searchlights. There were tunnels underneath Eben Email that led to supply stations, and the tunnels also connected into the city and the fort had its own power station, its own hospital, living quarters, and a communications center. Hitler had personally selected Captain Walter Koch to land on the roof with nine other gliders on the 10th of May in 1940, but Koch's glider's rope snapped and that would make him arrive late. While the British were preparing for Hitler to march into France in 1940, a small German plane crashed in Limburg in Belgium on the 10th of January, carrying the complete German invasion plans for liberating Belgium and France, and the German major with the plans was supposed to be taking them to a meeting in Cologne, but he had asked a pilot at the bar the night before to fly him to the Cologne meeting instead of his having to take the train. The German officer had asked the pilot to fly over the Meuse River because the plans described landing German paratroopers on the Belgian side of the Meuse River at Namur, and while scoping out the Meuse River, the plane crash-landed and the officer managed to burn the plans halfway when the Belgian authorities showed up and put out the fire, then arrested the German officer. The half-burned plans described Germany attacking through the Ardennes and crossing the Meuse north of Dinant to cut off the Belgian army from their supplies coming in through the port of Antwerp, and that starvation of supplies would force them to surrender within weeks. The Belgians discussed the captured plans as nonsense because a German army advancing through the poor roads of the Ardennes had seemed a certain impossibility. Before ordering the commando squad to head for Eben Email, the story evolved that Goering had practiced burning the same amount of papers in the same amount of time, but couldn't manage to come to a scientific conclusion as to whether the plans had been captured, and so he had called in some spiritual psychics who assured him that all the plans had been destroyed, but Hitler didn't believe any of it. It was said that Goering paid millions to a rainmaker to try and stop Hitler from going through with the plan at Eben Email. <coughs> Believing that documents had fallen into the wrong hands and that outsiders would interfere, but in the meantime, the Belgians just thought it was a trick, that the Germans were planning a massive invasion of France instead of a silly little putsch at Eben Email and someone claimed to have seen Goering working a pendulum over a map, trying to divine why England and France weren't attacking Germany yet. When Hitler had given the order to commence the operation to land in Norway and Denmark on the 9th of April, one of Canaris's best men had gone and warned the Scandinavians, but they simply didn't believe it either, because the Swedes knew that Hitler was a deal-maker and not the aggressive monster that the British newspapers had been denigrating. German planes took off from Cologne on the 10th of May in 1940 with four groups of gliders, and as the crews marched onto the tarmac towards the gliders that morning, loudspeakers trumpeted Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries, and the gliders would be released 20 miles away at an altitude of 7,000 feet, but they were spotted and took some anti-aircraft fire, so some stukas showed up to silence the guns. One of the glider groups 
had almost lost the element of surprise when the German army showed up 20 minutes too soon and the Belgians blew the bridge in front of them and until Eben Emil surrendered, out of more than 1,000 Belgian soldiers, 60 men were killed and 40 were wounded, while the Germans lost 6 killed and 19 wounded, and the victory at Eben Emil had been accomplished by 85 men in 11 gliders, while the other three groups of 11 gliders captured the three main bridges in Belgium to await the German 18th Army. Before the Germans marched into France, on the 10th of May in 1940, Britain and France had been trying to persuade Belgium to allow the British army onto Belgian soil ever since the war had started in September of 1939, but the captured plans from the downed German officer had been so far burned that they were basically undecipherable, and the chain of custody had been broken to add to their unreliability, not to mention that the pilot was dead and a British agent had been involved in the crash. So when Hitler marched into France on the 10th of May, he did not use the same strategy that had been discovered from the plane crash. Because of all the confusion in the initial fog of war, it would not be until the 22nd of June that France would surrender. The Nazis would live in France for the next 52 months, and before sending the tanks through Belgium, Hitler had told his generals that Germany had been at war with the West ever since 1648, and that Belgium had not even been a country until the Congress of Vienna, when that commie Napoleon had been defeated. The Dutch king had been brought back after the Congress of Vienna, and Holland and Belgium separated in 1830, after which a few more Orange Williams had ruled, until the Dutch king died in 1890, leaving only a girl child from his second wife, and this Wilhelmina, had become the king at the age of 10, and she had married a German prince in 1901. So for all intents and purposes, Belgium was part of the German Reich. When the Germans marched in on the 10th of May, the RAF stayed in England during the invasion, and the Dutch, Belgian, and French planes were inferior to the RAF. And on the 14th of June, the British offered France a proposed Franco-British Union, in which they offered to keep the French fleet safe so it could not be used against the British in North Africa after Hitler accepted France's imminent surrender. The French were supposed to sign it and turn the French fleet over to Britain, but there had been some argument about that. And while de Gaulle welcomed the idea of a common currency along with joint citizenship and a joint military with the British, a, pro a proposal of which Churchill highly approved, Many French leaders preferred being a German colony to any kind of union with Britain. Tuesday, July 4, 1944. Dr. O'Brien, my friend from the Rockefeller Foundation, visited me today. He said that the Germans were amazed in the early days of the Battle of Britain that Spitfires always seemed to be over their bombers no matter from which direction or directions they approached London. The reason was radar. Subsequently, when the Germans pushed into France, they captured an entire trainload of official documents from the British headquarters. They had been hurriedly gathered on the train, which was to make a special run for safety. My three years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 603. The French had figured out the plot by the 14th of May in 1940 that intended to leave them alone to face the Germans and instead of obeying the British order to attack the Germans, they sent their French troops over to rescue what was left of the French infantry. On the morning of the 14th of May, as the Germans were coming into France, Churchill ordered the French soldiers to come out from behind their Maginot line and march into Belgium to attack the Germans, but the French refused this order because the Germans outnumbered them twenty to one and the French had no anti-tank or anti-aircraft weapons, and Churchill called the French cowards, but the French knew better than to start another war for Britain. Two German commanders started moving towards Paris, but Hitler ordered them to halt, and Hitler hung out at the French border, 
posing for cameras with his generals and waiting for Churchill to commence the surrender, but as the clock ticked away, these two German generals disobeyed Hitler and moved forward in an attack on the French, even though the direct order from Hitler had been for them to stop on the 15th and pull back to the Meuse River, where they were supposed to keep the road into Belgium open for a British peace delegation to come through with the surrender documents that would end the war. The British newspaper the next day called it a rout and wrote it up as a great victory for Britain, and the same message went out over the radio, and Hitler called up Churchill to complain, but Churchill said it was just part of the plan to make it look like a real war, or no one would accept a negotiated peace. Meanwhile, in Belgium, a German squad of high-level officers sent on the 12th to join the glider crews at Eben Emil had run into some French troops that had gotten lost, and a small battle erupted involving a few tanks, and while thousands were dying on both sides in the confusion, the German Air Force was sent to escort the high-level squad, but nobody came to help the French, who withdrew the following night on the 13th of May. The German squad had been taking methamphetamine tablets as they drove through the night to reach Rotterdam the next morning, and they were in no mood to put up with the British movie cameras following a group of Belgian and German officials wandering unhappily up and down the deserted Belgian streets looking for the British envoys that were nowhere to be found. The Germans telephoned Hitler's CP, and Hitler phoned the French to ask where the British parley party was, and the French premier telephoned Churchill by noon on the 15th to inform him that France was out of the war. Churchill warned the French that if they continued to refuse to attack the Germans in Belgium, British bombers would be sent over, and it would be such a shame if the British mistook the French for Germans. But the French got wind of it, and started mingling with the British soldiers for safety's sake. The new French general ordered the French army, or what was left of it, to march north to Ypres towards Dunkirk, and then follow along the coast north to join the British, stuck between the furious Germans and the French, and it was supposed to bring about the final peace negotiations, where England would surrender and then help the Germans govern slippery France. Churchill started calling the French cowards again, and told the newspapers that the Germans were stopped at the Meuse, even though they had gone almost all the way to Rotterdam on the Scheldt Delta that led to the North Sea, and Rotterdam was where British spy headquarters had been during the Great War. When the peace party in Rotterdam had failed to show up on the 14th, Churchill blamed the Belgians for the holdup, so the Luftwaffe came in and bombed the center of the city, killing 1,000 and setting off a firestorm, and Hitler also threatened to bomb the city of Utrecht, and so the Dutch surrendered. The British newspapers claimed that 10,000 people had died in Rotterdam, and Churchill sent the RAF to bomb Germany's industrial Ruhr the next day, on the 15th, but they did not yet have bomb sites that allowed anything like precision bombing, so a few dozen German villages were hit as the RAF dropped incendiary bombs in the heart of the Ruhr, 40 miles east of Venlo. On the night of the 15th, the French commander ordered all French out of Belgium, and the following day, a 73-year-old Frenchman was called back from his comfortable station in Syria to take over command of the French armies now heading for home, but he wouldn't arrive in France until the 19th. On the night of the 16th, Hitler again ordered his armies to halt, and on the 17th of May, the British announced that all English were to report to Dunkirk, but they didn't tell the French. Churchill flew over to Paris on the 16th, because without a battle, how were the British supposed to enter into surrender terms with Germany? The German army occupied Boulogne on the seacoast, 
40 miles south of Dunkirk, the day the French were supposed to march north to Ypres, 20 miles inland from Dun Dunkirk, and the British soldiers sharing smokes with the Germans around Dunkirk found out that they were supposed to be sacrificed too, so the common English soldiers radioed home to England for help, where their friends and relatives had small boats that could bring them safely home, and that was the miracle of Dunkirk. The French were still refusing to attack and had completely capitulated, yet Churchill needed to bargain with Hitler from a position of strength, so Churchill sent his de Gaulle on the 17th to Mount Cornet, Cornet, Mont Cornet, on a suicide mission, but it didn't last long, and that had been the only French resistance that day, and that night the RAF was sent on another bombing run to Hamburg and Bremen, and they also hit the railway yards at Cologne. On the 18th of May, the new French general met with the Germans while de Gaulle shot at some more Germans until someone told him to give it up because France was surrendering and de Gaulle was ordered on the 18th to withdraw, but he purposefully ignored the order until the 19th when the Germans ceased fire as soon as Colonel de Gaulle stopped firing at them. De Gaulle had stopped shooting because he was running out of both ammo and gasoline, and when he had called for more supplies, the French refused to accommodate him. And from Wikipedia, Battle of France, Collapse on the Meuse, by 17 May, Rommel claimed to have taken 10,000 prisoners and suffered only 36 losses. Hitler worried that the advance was moving too fast. Halder recorded in his diary on 17 May that, quote, Fuhrer is terribly nervous. Frightened by his own success, he is afraid to take any chance and so would pull the reins on us. He keeps worrying about the south flank. He rages and screams that we are on the way to ruin the whole campaign, close quote. Using deception and creative interpretations of orders from Hitler and Kleist, demanding they halt in place, the front-line German commanders ignored Hitler's attempt to stop their westward advance towards Abbeville, and the Germans made it all the way to Abbeville that was 60 miles south of Dunkirk and 10 miles inland, against Hitler's direct orders and at a cost of 20,000 German killed, Germans killed and 1,000 planes lost, but three times that many Frenchmen had died along the way. Any sane person would have just rolled up over the British, but when Hitler showed up on the border with France, he was making frequent laudatory public statements about the British, saying how much he respected and admired them, and everyone thought Hitler had lost his mind, everybody down to the very last pair of boots on the ground. Movie cameras followed Hitler around as he walked back and forth on the other side of the border with France, and they made videos of him strolling and laughing alongside his 100 well-dressed senior commanders, and Hitler actually announced publicly that because France was now defeated, Britain would sign a peace treaty 